Well, our reading this morning is going to be Psalm 130. It's a mere eight verses, and we will also be starting a a new uh, book uh, of the Bible uh, that I'll be preaching through, the book of Malachi. And uh, we'll be tackling chapter one this morning, but for right now, Psalm 130. Psalm 130. I've got the ESV translation of the scriptures. If, uh, if you need a copy, there is a copy of the ESV Bible right in your pews. Psalm 130, starting in verse 1. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities... O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we just come before you rejoicing in this truth that you are a forgiving God, a loving God, a God who is to be feared, a God who is to be honored, a God who is to be rejoiced in. Thanks be to Jesus Christ. We know that our iniquities are not marked and held against us. Oh Lord, you are so gracious, merciful, long-suffering. God, we thank you that you've set your love upon those who have repented of their sins and believed on Christ. If it were not for that, if it were not for you setting your love upon us, God, we would be a people without any hope. But we are a people with hope, and we confidently expect that as we see in your word that you are a God who fulfills all of your prophecies and promises. Lord, we rejoice in the hope that awaits us. The rejoice, the the hope, rejoicing in the hope, God, of uh, a life apart from, removed from sin, a life of redeemed bodies, a life of living with you and knowing you completely, perfectly. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, we finished uh, 1 Timothy last week, and we're going to begin a, a new series uh, in the book of Malachi. Malachi is the last book found in your Old Testament. And Malachi is a, a mere 54 verses or so, broken into uh, four chapters. So uh, the Lord has put it on my heart. We're going to tackle a, a chapter at a time. And... Um, that it's going to take us into December. Pastor Rob's going to uh, preach the Sunday following uh, Thanksgiving. And then we will enter into uh, a few Sundays uh, studying the birth of Jesus Christ. And at the turn of the new year, uh, we're going to enter into the Gospel of John. So, But here we are today, Malachi, in chapter 1. Uh, I've entitled this sermon, The Fear, Love, and Holiness of the Lord. The Fear, Love, and Holiness of the Lord. Malachi chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says they may build, but I will tear down and they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. 
Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, How have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, How have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now, entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is, its food may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick. And this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand? says the Lord. Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Let us pray. The Holy Spirit, we thank you for this, your word. We ask that you would just open our eyes, open our hearts, help us to understand, help us to know, help us to be a people that hear and fear and love and do. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, let me uh, first give you just a little bit of uh, the historical context of the, the book of Malachi. So it was written roughly around 425 BC. And the last 400 years of, or so between the Old Testament, this is the close of the Old Testament, and the New Testament is called the intertestamental period. And there's, there's no word of the Lord after the, the book of Malachi. And it's written after the exile of the Jews from Babylon was over. The temple has been rebuilt, and a remnant of the Jews have found themselves back in the promised land. And so that's who this, this book is written to. You know, God had proven himself to be wise, uh, prophetic, trustworthy, steadfast, and faithful, among other things. Israel, the... Not all of Israel, but many, the unfaithful, the unrepentant, the unregenerate, had been justly punished for their continuous disobedience and rebellion. Yet God had saved a remnant according to his promise. And here they found themselves. Thanks be to a long-suffering and forgiving God. They were on the precipice of inheriting the promises of the Old Testament that God had made to Israel. Thousands of years and dozens of generations after the Exodus, the Jewish people still existed. Anyway, I think we take that for granted. There have been many nations who have come and gone during this time period, yet the Jews still 
exist, and not because they were stronger or greater, more faithful. They existed because of God. And God was still ready to pardon their iniquities. But this remnant, like the many before them, had begun to entertain sin and stray from the Lord. Malachi's name, actually, when translated, means my messenger. He ministered during the time of Nehemiah, and it was after the time of prophets Haggai and Zechariah. And his message is a warning. A warning of the impending judgment that was coming if the people did not repent of their sin and mend their ways. And his style is one of a rhetorical debate. We catch a glimpse of that here in chapter 1. And what does that mean? What does a rhetorical debate mean? Well, God, through Malachi, would make a statement and then immediately follows it up with the Israelites' anticipated objection. And then he exposes their guilt before their eyes. And we, we caught a glimpse of that. I have loved you, but you say, how have you loved us? That's the rhetorical debate that takes place throughout this in, entire short book. You know, the Israelites' wicked hearts are evidenced through the proof of their ungodly actions. And that's the charge. The, the charges we will see that God brings against the Israelites are related to their hearts, which are revealed through their actions. You know, in chapter 1, we find the priests bringing polluted offerings as sacrifices. They're not adhering to and they're neglecting the proper sacrificial offerings that the Lord had prescribed for the people. Why? Why did they do this? Why are they bringing these polluted offerings? Well, God tells us they, they detest and loathe God. They're, they're not happy with what has transpired. They're not happy with the suffering that they've gone through. And they are people who question God, who are not satisfied in Him. And so, the key word that I would use for the first chapter is despise. They despise God. In chapter 2, we find both the priests and the people breaking covenant with God by turning aside for the law and committing adultery, both spiritual adultery in the, in the case of the priests and then physical adultery in the case of many men who are pursuing, they're seeking to divorce their wives and pursuing foreign women. So if chapter 1, if the key word is despise, chapter 2, I think the key word is divorce. In chapter 3, we find the people holding back in their giving of the required tithes and contributions. And they're charged with robbing God. And so we go from despise to divorce to chapter 3, the key word is defraud. And then in chapter 4, we find God warning the people that many of them will be found wanting on the great day of the Lord when He comes to judge the earth. So we go from despise to divorce to defraud to destruction. So we have those four words to help us to remember some of the key themes of the book. Despise, divorce, defraud. These are all acts of the people. And then chapter 4, the threatened act by God of destruction. But why 
Why would we study this book of the Old Testament? Especially it's written to the Israelites. It says it right there in verse 1. It's a word to Israel. What practical value does Malachi bring to the modern day church? Stephen Wellam, who's a a professor uh, at Southern uh, Baptist Theological Seminary, he states it this way. Malachi, if properly read and applied, is a precious book for the church today. Three truths which the book of Malachi teach us today. First, Malachi reminds us of the sinfulness of the human heart and that apart from God's covenant promises and determination to redeem his people, we have no hope or salvation. The return of the exile from the exile has not changed the hearts of the Jews. And one would think that after experiencing the curses of the covenant in exile, the people's hearts would not remain the same. But sadly, this is not the case. What several of the previous prophets, and he cites Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, had anticipated in terms of new hearts and the dawning of the new creation and ultimately the establishment of the new covenant has not taken place. And if you're familiar with Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they all speak to the new hearts and the new covenant and the forthcoming of those things. But those things have not taken place. God will have to do something more than merely bring the nation back from exile. He will have to provide a better servant, an obedient Messiah, who will usher in the day of the Lord in judgment and in salvation. Second, Malachi reminds us that it is only in God's provision of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of God's promises and new life results. In describing the desperate situation of Israel, Malachi also points forward in hope to God's sovereign action to redeem. How will this come about? Consistent with the teaching of all of the prophets, it will come about by God himself bringing salvation and judgment. In judgment, God will defeat our enemies, purge his people, and accomplish our salvation in his Messiah. And we'll see that as we move through Malachi. We'll see it in chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. And in this way, Malachi looks forward to the coming of his messenger, Elijah, who will ultimately prepare the way for the coming of Yahweh himself. And in the New Testament, these prophetic anticipations come to fruition in the coming of John the Baptist, who prepares the way of the Lord Jesus. He is Elijah, the coming of Elijah. And the Lord Jesus, who is nothing less than the eternal Son, made flesh. From Malachi and the entire New Testament, we are reminded that it is only by our triune God acting in sovereign grace to provide his own son that we have salvation. All of God's Old Testament promises are only true and fully fulfilled in Jesus Christ our Lord. And thirdly, Wellam says, in light of these truths, like the people of faith described in Hebrews chapter 11, we as the church... Learn to trust God's promises more now that Christ has come. And as we read Malachi, we can see how God has kept all of his covenant promises perfectly in Christ. End quote. And so with those thoughts in mind, let us enter into our text, which is the word of God. We look at verse 1. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. So we see that this book is written specifically to Israel. And two major points of emphasis that we uncover in these first 14 verses. 
God is the God of all Israel, but not all of Israel is the Israel of God. I'll say that again. God is the God of all Israel, but not all of Israel is the Israel of God. I'll put it to you another way. There are many people who are part of a church, but not all are Christians. The second point, only those who fear God and cherish him and his grace and mercy toward them and keep his commands are God's treasured possession. The distinction between the righteous and the wicked of Israel the one who serves God with his whole heart and the one who does not. If one is truly a servant or a follower or a believer of God, what will that man be doing? He'll be fearing God. You know, when Matt of Matt and Alice Rody Christian Fellowship were here, and he preached, he said something that resonated with me and that I'm going to use here. He said, God is good, but God is not safe. God is good, but God is not safe. What does that mean? God is holy, 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 and we are not. And for us to think that we can just casually walk with God or casually enter into God's presence or casually abide by some of God's word and not others. That's a danger. That is a danger. So fearing God, first and foremost, that's what that man will be doing. What else would be loving God, submitting to him and exalting him as opposed to exalting oneself and requiring God to accommodate his every desire. And the fear of God and the love of God cannot be separated. And so that man who's truly a servant, who's truly a follower, who's truly a believer is going to be fearing God, loving God, and is going to be honoring God and pursuing holiness, honoring God through his actions and pursuing holiness, because that is what is required for us to be with God, to enter into God's presence. And we, apart from God, we have no hope of that. But thanks be to Jesus Christ. Thanks be to the forgiveness and the, the steadfastness and the willingness of God to want us with him and to conform, him, uh, conform us into the likeness of his son. Well, that man's going to be fearing God, loving God, honoring God, and pursuing holiness. Works that flow from a heart of belief and obedience. Not works to gain God's approval. Works that flow from this love and this fear rejoicing in who God is and what he has done. And the guide for that man, sola scriptura. Reformation Day was October 31st. I sent you an email last week with some really interesting links to help you understand more about the Reformation and why it, it should be something that we celebrate and long to learn more about. Men who recognized that what the church was doing was not grounded and based in the scriptures alone. There was a lot of pollution that was being added to the word of God. God's word to us is our first, final, and supreme authority when it comes to all things pertaining to life and godliness. What does man know about God, about holiness, 
about true worship. What does man know? Apart from the Word of God, absolutely nothing. And so we rejoice in the Holy Scriptures given to us by God. And so these truths are applicable and they're true. What was true for Israel in 425 B.C. is true for the people of God today. You know, the word oracle, very interesting. I didn't know this until I, I started studying this week. The word oracle can also be translated as burden. <coughs> the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Now, that's interesting, especially when you link it with verse 13. But you say, what a weariness this is. Why might we translate it this way? Why, why might we translate it as the burden of the word of the Lord? Because clearly the Jews viewed God's word to them as a burden. Do we make the same error? Do we look at praying and reading and loving and giving and forgiving as burdens? Do we say, oh, what a weariness this is? And what did Jesus say about his burden, about his yoke? It's light and easy, right? Light and easy. Why? Because he is the one who saves. He is the one who justifies, who sends his spirit to sanctify, who will testify to the Father on our behalf in glory. In Christ alone, we find rest because he has fulfilled the law. What, what God asks of us, we should not look at as a burden, but as a joy, as a privilege. We've been called out. We've been equipped. We've been given supernatural revelation to the God of the universe. Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 27. Jesus speaking here, all things have been handed over to me by my father and no one knows the son except the father. and No one knows the father except the son and anyone to whom the son chooses to reveal the father. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's only in and through the person and the finished work of Jesus Christ that we find rest from the weariness of being at enmity with God. Returning now to Malachi, looking at verses 2 to 5. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down, and they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. And God makes a statement, I have loved you. And the people say, really? All this suffering is your way of loving us? 
Why would a good and loving God make us suffer like this? They have lost track of reality. They have forgotten who they are. Sinners. And they have forgotten who God is. Holy, loving, creator of each one of them, creator of all things. And they have forgotten what he has done for them. God changed Jacob and changed his name. God's desire is that all of the offspring of Jacob be changed as well. You remember, we'll touch on it here in a little bit. Jacob was renamed Israel. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 says this, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. He's talking about the nation of Israel. Remember, he, he, in Exodus, he declares that Israel is his firstborn son. God loved the people of Israel by choosing them. He did not have to. He did not have to choose anyone. And that's still true today. He chose them for his glory. Not because they were better. Not because they were more powerful. Not because they were up righteous, upstanding, and, and righteous. Deuteronomy chapter 7, starting in verse 6. The Lord speaking to the people of Israel. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers, that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generation, generations and repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. You shall therefore be careful to do the commandment and statutes and rules that I command you today. Well, what is the oath that God swore to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? We just we go back a, a little farther in the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 12, it started with Abraham. Verse 2, God speaking to Abraham. Abram at the time, and I will make you of you a great nation. Listen, don't lose sight of that fact. I will make of you. I will. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you. I will curse and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And the same blessing was given by Abraham to Isaac. In Genesis 26, and from Isaac to Jacob in Genesis 27. It goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15. The offspring of the woman that would crush the serpent's head 
would come through Israel. There are only two lineages of human beings according to Genesis 3.15. The offspring of the woman and the offspring of the serpent. And we see this immediately, Genesis chapter 4. Abel and Cain. We see it with Isaac and Ishmael. We see it with Esau and Jacob. I'm always amused. Don't see them too often, but for a stretch there, I saw a lot of commercials for things like Ancestry.com and 23andMe and all these genealogy lineage figure out who your ancestors were yeah. make it real simple you're either the offspring of Christ or you're the offspring of the serpent that's it there's just two lineages and all of us start off in one camp Esau's descendants were the Edomites, offspring of the serpent. And Jacob's descendants were God's people. Why? Because that's what God decided. God chose. God is saying to the Israelites, Edom is where you would be if I had not chosen you and loved you. You know, the, the actual birth we find in, in Genesis chapter 25, starting in verse 19. Listen to this. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Padim Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. And when her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Two children conceived at the same time in the same womb. The firstborn, Esau, had all the privilege. Yet he forfeited it. He was even favored by his father. God tells us. Jacob actually preferred him. I mean, Isaac actually preferred him, but Jacob received the blessing and the inheritance. Why? Because of God's electing love. God chose Jacob. Not because he was more righteous than Esau. When you read about the type of person Jacob was, he was not an upstanding individual. He was not righteous. He was not blameless. He was a crooked wheeler, dealer, manipulator, sinner. God's electing love. Isaiah chapter 41, starting in verse 8. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, 
whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corner, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I will, I will, I will, I have, I have chosen you. I am with you. One of the things that I think it's so important to understand about the doctrine of election and electing love is this, is that what God has begun in us, God is going to bring to completion. It's God who saves. It's not God who starts to save and then we pick it up from there and bring it home. God chooses us. God chose me not because of anything good within me, but because of his sovereign choice. I am what I am. Thanks be to Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 10. Here's what Paul writes. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So when God says, I have loved you, he's saying, I chose you to be my vessel of grace and mercy. I chose you for the glory of my name. You will be saved only because I have saved you. I elected you. I justified you. I am sanctifying you and I will glorify you. If it weren't for my electing love, you would all be Edomites trapped in your unbearable bondage to sin with no way out. And the same is true for those of us who are Christians today. First John chapter 4, verse 19. We love because he first loved us. Love is inherent and intrinsic in God, not in us. Are you rejoicing in God's electing love today? Are you praising his name for choosing you? Or have you forgotten, like the Israelites, what God has done for you? In those moments where we're tempted to forget, where we're tempted to be weighed down by the things of this world, never forget. God chose you. He set his love on you. He went to the cross for you. Returning to Romans, just to drive this point home. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace 
as a gift, as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. What do you do with the gift? You receive it. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God has loved us, church. Don't never forget that. See how he has loved us. The entire world sees and the entire world will see that the end of verse 5, they will see how great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. Look at the beginning of verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. Note, fear and love are two sides of the same coin. The fear of God, the truth that our existence, our eternity rests in God's hands. We sit here today and breathe Only because of God's grace and mercy. The fear of God will drive us to the love of God, rejoicing in the forgiveness that God offers to repentant sinners. And the fear of God that drives us to the love of God will lead us to honor and serve Him exclusively, believing and obeying His commands to us. Fear and love cannot be divided. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? Their actions, their actions are bad enough, but their actions reveal a heart issue. It's the same issue that Cain had with his offering. Cain brought not, he didn't bring the required offering. And what he brought was half-hearted. This is where they're at. Both the Israelites, Amalekai's day and Cain had the same issue. They despised God. Not my words. God's words. They despised God. There was no fear. No fear of God. Therefore, there was no love. Therefore, there was no honor. Their half-hearted, corrupt worship of God comes from their evil hearts. They desecrate the Lord's table because they despise him and his word. If they had tried that with their earthly rulers, what would have happened? If they had brought these sick and lame animals to their rulers, would their earthly rulers have accepted them? Would their earthly rulers said, well, at least you brought me something. Thanks for, thanks for honoring me. How much more so with God? 
verses 9 and 10. And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. Entreat the favor of God. What does that mean? Repent and seek mercy. God is a long-suffering God. But long-suffering doesn't mean eternally suffering. Entreat the favor. He will pardon. Repent and seek mercy. Shut the doors. Stop what you are doing, this false worship, this hypocritical nonsense. Just shut the doors to the temple. It brings me no pleasure. In fact, what you offer and how you choose to worship me is evil. I take no pleasure in you. And your ungratefulness toward me. Verse 11. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Why will it be great? Why will it be proclaimed? Why will God be known amongst the nations? Not because of the Israelites, not because of any man, but because of the son of man. This is a prophetic statement. The promise of the coming Messiah. Verses 12 and 13. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is its food, may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick. And this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? One commentator put it like this. What bizarre behavior to offer a sacrifice for the atonement of your sin, but to offer a defective sacrifice, a sick sacrifice. It was the extraordinary sin of despising the means of atonement and forgiveness provided by God. What bizarre behavior to offer this sick, lame sacrifice for atonement. Think about that for a second. I'm talking about cutting off your nose to spite your face. And they weren't harming God. They're harming themselves. And so it is with us. When we fail to pursue God in a relationship with God, so it is when, when we don't pick up God's word for days or weeks at a time, we're, we don't detract from God. We're not hurting God. When we refuse to pray, that's not counted against God. When we for, refuse to give or to forgive Who's that hurting? Take the other side of it. When we do read, when we do pray, when we do give, when we do forgive, God overflows in his blessing and abundance. 
and strength. This commentator continues, he says, they were not only despising God, but also despising the means of atonement and forgiveness that he had provided. Are we despising Christ? Look at him on the cross, bleeding, dying, suffering for you. Sick sacrifices are signs of sick people and priests. It's bad to be a hypocrite to show off to others. It is futile to be a hypocrite when approaching God. God knows our hearts. God's people in Malachi's day were very blinded by their sin, for they despised God's means of atonement while also ignoring God's impending judgment of wrath. Verse 14. Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king. Present tense. Says the Lord of hosts. And my name will be feared among the nations. Future, future tense. Cursed be the cheat who despises what God has given him and seeks to return to God only a portion. This is the story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. Right? They sell the land and they come to the apostles and what do they tell them? Hey, we sold the land. I'm making up a price here. It doesn't say. We sold the land. For $20,000, here it is. And they laid $20,000 at the apostles' feet because they had just seen Barnabas do this and everybody was like, whoa, that's amazing. Only problem was they sold the land for $30,000, held back ten, dollars said they sold it for twenty, dollars and were bringing the full offering. It, compare the end of verse 15, uh, 14 excuse me, of Malachi chapter 1. With the end of Acts, or I should say, verse 11 of Acts chapter 5. I'll, I'll read it. So, Ananias and Sapphira, what happens? They, <laughs> they are struck dead right then and there. Struck dead. Here's what Acts chapter 5, 11 says. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Look at Malachi chapter 1, the end of verse 14. And my name will be feared among the nations. For I am a great king. My name will be feared. Note the already but not yet tension of this closing verse. Today is a day of grace and mercy and salvation. But tomorrow. When Christ comes again. That day of mercy and grace. Is over. Fear, love, and honor of God are all inextricably linked. They cannot be divided. When we rightly fear God, we're drawn to the love of God. And from there, our desire is to rightly honor God with our acts of worship. So what do we take away from this chapter? Because we're not... In the year 425 BC, we're approaching 2024. Remember how God has loved you in and through Jesus Christ. Do not take that for granted. Ask God to help you to stir within you 
a, just a new and greater understanding of that incredible act, incredible act of love. Number two, fear sin, fear God. Sin separates us from God. And God will not tolerate our continuing in sin. He will not tolerate our continuing in sin when, and especially when, we know the way of righteousness. He will not tolerate our despising him. Do not be foolish and do not be short-sighted, but remember the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Get wisdom. Get insight. Number three, honor the Lord with your best always. In everything that you do. Every moment that you're living is an act of worship. Honor the Lord with your best. Be good stewards of your body. Bring your best offering. Treat people as image bearers. Work. Give your best effort in whatever you're doing at work. Do your best. Bring your best. Worship is not going to stop here. In about seven or eight minutes, you walk out that door, you are worshiping. Holiness is the end game. Never forget that. Holiness is the end game. We are being conformed into the likeness of Christ. Christ in his humanity suffered. He suffered more than any of us will. He suffered more than all of us combined will. Suffering and holiness go hand in hand for the Christian. That's what we're told in Scripture. Never forget that. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're struggling with, whatever's hard right now, worship. Worship. Remember, God has loved you. And then finally, through all of our failings, remember this promise. The Lord will not leave you, nor will he forsake you. He will not leave you, nor will he forsake you. What he has started, he will bring to completion. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Run to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you uh, for this great and glorious day. Father, we thank you for this amazing word, Lord. Uh, God, we Lord, the way that, that your word brings simultaneously conviction and healing is just beyond being able to describe, Lord, but we rejoice in it. And we thank you that, that we can come to you and seek your forgiveness. And I pray that each of us here in this room this morning would do just that. We wouldn't talk about repentance, but we actually would. We would come, we would contemplate what you've just spoken to us. And we would come and you've changed our minds. You've shown us, Lord, who you are, who we are, that we would change our minds, that we would run to you, ask you. If, if there's anyone here who's not put their trust in Christ, that they would do that here this morning. And for those of us that have, that we would, we would come to you and ask you to forgive us. And that forgiveness would lead to a change of action 
And we would change our ways. And we would change our ways for the glory of your name. We would change our ways to demonstrate our worship, our love, our fear. Oh God, we want you to be honored. You and you alone deserve all glory. Lord, we thank you. Uh, We praise you. And we pray this in the precious and the mighty, the matchless, the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He who has called you is faithful. He will surely do it. Good day and God bless.